infrastructure, service delivery, innovation, we always forget half of the population. Women are not at the center of decision making. They don't have the agency and their voices are often very subdued, if at all heard. What we are asking for is a very level playing field. It makes sense from markets. It makes sense when you think of your consumers and I think makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about human rights. So if we are talking about a global world where we want equity for all, then women cannot be left out of any part. They have to be in the boardroom, they have to be at the center of decision making, how resources are allocated, and the value add will be 10x. It's already been proved. Where women have a strong voice in boardrooms, companies perform better. Even from economic sense, it makes sense. From human rights, it's a non-negotiable. It's not easy. We all live with those biases that we have grown up with. They are 5,000 years old or more. We have to break down those barriers, make the world equitable. That means in our sector, more than anywhere else. They suffer the most when they don't have it. The problems are magnified because of our biologies and the social-cultural impact of when we get it right is so worth the effort. So there is now, in 2019, a non-negotiable. As I hope, in 2020, we shouldn't be talking about gender equity. It should be taken for granted in our sector. And I believe water and sanitation can be the exemplar in this. Utilities, especially in emerging economies, have a problem. They have a problem of a mixture of poor people and rich people. And yet all these people need water in order to be able to achieve goal number six of SDGs. So we are looking at utilities being able to discuss with their governments so that they can give them grants to be able to finance those people who cannot be able to get water. And be able to charge those who can pay so that there is some cross-subsidy within the system. We are also looking at utilities to be able to use technology because technology is important. Technology helps these utilities to be more efficient. Technology helps these utilities to be more productive. We are also looking at governance. Governance is very, very important. With poor governance, most utilities, especially in emerging economies, have got a problem. So we are looking at that also. We are also looking at Staff, utilities must engage their staff. There's no utility that is going to make a difference if the staff there are not doing a good job. So I'm basing all this on the case study of national water, what we have been able to do in national water, increasing geographical coverage, and also increasing the turnover in the last six years. We have increased our turnover more than three times. We now collect over 100%. We, the profits have grown almost three times. We are also emphasizing collaboration. We need to collaborate. We are no longer talking of best practice now, we are talking of next practice, a practice which is better than the way you are doing things and you can achieve this through collaboration. Utilities, especially in emerging economies, they need to know that they can do it. This business of thinking that somebody else will come and do it for you, is not correct. In National Water, we have done it, we continue to use a do it ourselves policy and it is helping us. So let us believe ourselves, let us know that the utilities we manage are the utilities to serve our countries so that we can help our countries to grow to better standards. Good morning, everybody. We're ready to start our third day here at the conference. My name is Tom Kunitz. I am the immediate past president of the Water Environment Federation, and I come from Chicago in the United States. 
This is my first time in Sri Lanka. By show of hands, how many people here is your first time visiting Sri Lanka? And keep your hands up if you intend to come back again someday. Yeah, I do too. I was fortunate to be able to have a few days before the conference where I spent in central Sri Lanka in the mountain region, very beautiful region. And I went hiking up to a mountaintop, a place called El Arak. It was raining the entire time, muddy trails, wet, slippery, but I made it to the top in order to see a big cloud in front of me. So I figured after a while I'm going to go, but just before I left, the wind shifted and the cloud moved away for about 30 seconds so I could look down and see this beautiful valley, very, very deep, wonderful, spread out valley. And I thought, that's what it is like sometimes with us coming up with ideas. We work and we work and we work and all we see is a cloud in front of us. And then at one moment when we're not even thinking, suddenly the idea comes to us. And psychologists talk about the work that's going on in our subconscious to make connections and push it forward into the consciousness. Thank you. I'm a little tall for this. And so, when we work towards innovation, when we're talking about innovation on our panel today, it is something that was often has to work at and that the connections are not always immediately made. It takes some patience, it takes some effort, and some relaxing and letting those thoughts and the ideas connect and make those connections. And we're going to be talking about that today. So to start off this very good session on innovation to overcome global water challenges, we have an excellent keynote speaker who is perfect for top, talking about the topic of innovation. We have Valerie Naidu. Now, Valerie is the Executive Manager of Business Development and Innovations at the Water Research Commission, where she has worked for the past 10 years. And Valerie is also the past president of the Water Institute of South Africa and the previous chair of the Board of the Water Institute of South Africa. And she has her master's and PhD degrees from the University of KwaZulu Natal. So please give a warm welcome for Valerie Naidu. Um, I'm a little short, so I'm not going to stand behind the podium. And as you can see, in the interest of gender equality, uh, the title is in pink. So today I'm going to be speaking about innovation to, uh, to overcome global water challenges. So if we look at um, essentially what are the challenges that drive innovation? So we speak a lot about urbanization. So you see that lovely picture of a city and we speak about climate change, and we speak about rising sea levels, how is that going to affect us, uh, increased in amounts of CO2, uh, and the ice caps melting. So when we talk about climate change, we talk about all of these things. How do we manage it? How do we, uh, how do we prepare for the future? And then we speak also about industrialization, and different countries are at different stages. But generally, when we speak about industrialization, you speak about these massive factories making things at scale. Now we start talking about the fourth industrial revolution and robotics. And at the same time, we're also always accurately, uh, accurately aware of biodiversity. So one needs to protect your biodiversity, especially in the water sector, because it's where you draw much of your water from. However, when you speak about these four uh, drivers of innovation, you also have to look at it through a different lens. And the developing world lens is essentially urbanization that looks like that. Uh, lots of informal settlements, cities growing at a far more rapid rate uh, than we are used to. Uh, essentially, with climate change in most of these countries, uh, the infrastructure is not there, the resilience is not there, and so it has a direct impact on livelihoods and people on their houses, they don't have insurance. Uh, and so it has very different repercussions to some of the stuff we talk about in science. And when we talk about industrialization, I mean, it's a, it's a nice thing, and people put growth plans in place, etc. but many countries struggle to actually reach the kind of industrialization 
and economic growth plans that they, that they work towards. And as a result, they don't necessarily have the sufficient capital to invest in the sort of uh, water solutions that they want. And of course, when we start talking about biodiversity, we all, you know, if you're coming from a science background, you want to protect everything. You want to protect the trees and the forests and the rivers. But there's a human factor to it. And that human factor is around livelihoods. People live off the land. They fish. Uh, they, they chop wood. They basically uh, live off this, the spaces in which they've been living for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Sorry. I'm pressing it back with uh, okay. Okay, so if one looks at the space of these four major challenges that drive innovation, if you look through an innovation lens, it's very different to a developed world versus a developing world. And I think we need to be aware of that. So innovations in that space can be very different for these two types of environments. So what are the big areas that we talk about when we talk about uh, research? We talk about the SDGs, how do we attain it? It has a whole lot of things that we're supposed to do and we prepare for it. So do we prepare by learning from others? Possibly. But in some spaces, learning from others doesn't work for our environment. We don't have the same governance systems. We don't have the same revenue models. We don't have the same economic growth. We don't have the same capacity and capability on the ground to roll out some of these uh, solutions. And we don't have enough water in some areas, as simple as that. When one starts talking about uh, climate change, one starts talking about the, the pos possibility of vulnerability. And it's good enough to, to understand what, what is the vulnerability of the different cities. We also start talking about resilience. So how do I build resilient cities? How do I work towards resilient cities? And what actually constitutes resilience? Is it about infrastructure and infrastructure protection in water? It is, to some extent. But I would say it's more about how do you build resilient societies? How, how do societies are able to adapt to some of the disruptions that we would expect in the future? In those spaces, I would go so far as to say, therein lies a whole lot of innovation opportunities and potentials. Largely because you're talking about households. How do I prepare households to be more resilient towards some of the disruptions that we see in future? The water, energy, food nexus, another big area that we actually drive uh, innovations through water security, energy security, food security, through the nexus eye is critical in most of the spaces that we are working with. We know that as our water levels deplete in some of these areas, food security becomes far more tenuous. And of course, with food security comes a whole lot of destabilization effects. And the one that most of us have been playing around if you're in the research and development space is around the circular economy. So we all know what the intent is. We want to transform waste into something that's useful, something that's beneficial. But how do you do it? We haven't quite figured out our value chains yet. We haven't quite figured out our revenue models. So in those spaces, how do we accelerate innovations that emanate from those four domains? Now, if I look at some of the developing countries, the way, if we had to use a largely linear process, it is unlikely that we would make any significant change in the space of transforming or moving any of those, those categories forward. And the reason I say this is because, to a large extent, if I look at the Water Research Commission and our portfolio, and these, this is a, st a funnel which basically is, is, is speaking to the stage gate process, and I can say at the scale-up pre-com phase, there's a whole lot of tech that just sits there for decades, if, if anything. And so the question is, you know, I've developed this, I've scaled it up, somebody liked it, but I can't get more than one municipality maybe to, to test it. So how do we move it to commercialization? And it's quite clear that we have a problem in the system around innovations. And in this space, there's a whole lot. If you look at the bottom layer, there's a whole lot of players in, in the South African system, at least. 
The point is that all of them are not aligned. They're all not streamlined. They all don't have the same priority areas, and they don't fund critical mass into an area. And so the likelihood is you've got this lone innovator or tech developer, and they actually just move through the system, knocking on doors, and basically never quite get to where they're supposed to be. Is that innovation good or bad? It's hard to say sometimes, because sometimes the technology is not failing. The system is failing. So one of the key things is, oh, we don't have enough money for innovation. So if we plot in the South African system itself uh, from where we do basic research and who funds that space, yes, it's not up there with, with most of the, uh, I would call, fast-growing uh, economies where they're putting 2%, 3%, 4% of their GDP into their R&D. But we got sufficient in the system. And then if you look at all the other funders and you say, well, is there enough funds for companies, SMMEs, innovators, tech developers to actually move their technology forward? Most of them would say, yes, we have. We have enough funds. The point again is that it takes a whole lot of bureaucracy, a whole lot of paperwork, a whole lot of business cases, a whole lot of proposals for these innovators to keep jumping through that space. And so is this the ideal way in which we drive innovation? I would say that for some of the innovation, if it is really, really innovative and it's going to be a game changer, you've got enough funds uh, allocated to investors, et cetera, it's going to hit the market. But by and large, in the system itself, whether it emanates from universities or some of the smaller startups, the likelihood is it will fail. We in the research and development space often speak about the early stage value of death, and we speak about the innovation chasm. That's the first chasm that you see there. But if one asks the question, so how do I take it to the commercial market, you start to see there is another chasm in some of the spaces. So what is that second chasm? If you're disrupting a space, you actually have to develop a market in that space. There must be a willingness to pay for that. There must be aspirational value in terms of wanting to move there. You've got to move a system in that space. So there, it's not just a case of getting the rands and cents right, or should I say the dollars uh, right in that space, but it's also about how do you create that market around new spaces. And who does it? Who does it in this entire system? Is it the innovator? Is it the public sector? Is it the private sector? Is it the consumer? We all play in the space. And of course, industrialization, right? We all want to move to scale-up models. We want, uh, rather than do one job at a time, sell one tech at a time, can we move to scale-up models? The truth is, in the water sector, if you look at the level of uh, where we're thinking about some of the technologies, the SMMEs, the uh, tech developers, they don't even think at that level. So they don't think about scale-up differently. And if you don't think about scale-up differently, then you don't explore the opportunities that are already in the system. So currently in the water sector, you know, we'll think about 100 megaliter per day plant. So scale-up for us is large. How about 100,000, one kiloliter plants? Is that possible? That's, for me, where innovation challenges need to shift, especially around developing countries. Because again, I don't think we have enough money to put large infrastructure in place over this interim period while we're developing. So I'm going to use an example here. Uh, you must have seen quite a bit around the sanitation space, but I thought maybe to take you through the process of why we've kind of shifted in that. On the top, you see some very nice pictures. Those are pictures of South Africa, so very, derby, uh, very developed, affluent. Uh, in many of these spaces, these are off-grid spaces. So either we sh we're trying to force green building spaces, uh, either we've got eco-estates eco and, and, and holiday uh, spaces, or we've got these, these nodes in South Africa where we call these uh, the gas stations or the filling stations. And all of them are looking for either decentralized or off-grid systems. So they're all looking for how to move into something that's a little bit more uh, green, should I say. And right now, they come knocking on the door, and there's nothing really there other than a smaller version of a centralized plant. 
a decentralized system. Of course, on the bottom end, you see the challenges around whether it's informal settlements or the hilly terrains that you have to put water and sanitation in or the very rural, remote spaces where, to be honest, a pipeline or a network solution is not possible. So this idea of urban and rural, the two extremes, what's the missing middle? Now, years of research, both globally, locally within South Africa, led us to believe that there are certain key insights that we're coming across continuously. And there was an aspiration. So in South Africa, that aspiration was, I would like the convenience of a flushing toilet. But in some areas, we don't have water. And in some areas, we're never going to get a reticulated system. So what do you provide them in between? Of course, the opportunity that we could have taken here is to go and look for one technology at a time. One technology at a time, and basically say, OK, let's keep testing it through these different stages that I spoke about uh, before. But the likelihood is you're not going to really transform a system. You're not really going to get impetus or critical mass in that area. So the way we looked at it was to create a sanitation transformative initi uh, initiative. And in this space, we first set a vision. The first vision that we set was actually a science or engineering vision, one of disruption. We said, let's disrupt the space. And then we set a vision of advocacy. And in this space, it wasn't just us alone. There was a small, committed mass of people also thinking a little bit differently in this space. So it's about global friends and local friends bringing them together, and that advocacy started to grow. And in South Africa, we said, well, OK, if we're going to move to these off-grid situation, can we think about this differently? Is it one tender at a time, one spec for one settlement at a time? Or can we think about this as a potential sunrise industry, especially in terms of where we were seeing this technology go? And so we actually were able to plot an industrial pathway possibility when we set this innovation uh, challenge. And this was linked to things that previously in the innovation space we wouldn't be thinking about from a research development and innovation uh, commission. We're thinking about manufacturing, distribution, servicing models, and how do I develop the market. Of course, you have to have the right policy, right? Because public sector doesn't move without the right policy in place. And there we worked with our Department of Water and Sanitation. I'm happy to say their new sanitation paper is all inclusive of this new non sewered off-grid sanitation systems and inclusive of the circular economy uh, concepts that we're driving. Market development. So how, how do you shift markets in the space? Well, the guys that were doing the ISO standard, we quickly adopted that in South Africa. So we now have an SABS 3500 standard. And we actually envisage a number of other standards that will come in this place. Standards related to the products that some of these technologies will actually uh, create. And then from there, I'm happy to say that last week we went into another meeting, and this time our national department that's, that's in, in, involved in building regulations, they said, well, we're happy to now include the standards in the building regulations. So now these off-grid household systems have a standard and a building regulation attached to it. What does this mean? It signals to the sector that they can now go and start looking for the kind of technologies that we want. Of course, the designation and the model tender specification will come as we roll out this program going forward. But those are two of the other key components that will lead to a market development process. The third one was technology. So we didn't, again, look at one tech at a time. We looked at the basket. We've got the Gates program. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're essentially going to look inside and outside. And we're going to do the connect connectivity between these processes. Why? Some people were looking at developing the front part of the toilet. Others were uh, looking at developing the back end of the toilet. Some would full recycle systems. Some would systems that were on the sort of thermal pathway of transforming the waste fully. So it's about looking at everything that's in the basket. And others were looking at, how do I actually have the servicing models that is able, if I separate urine, for example, make that into a product and use it in the agricultural space. 
So there are various other models that we are seeking in that space, and it's important to understand that. Not a single tech, but a system of tech that is out there. And ultimately, our vision is that the strongest will survive. The ones where the market actually is able to say, that's the kind of product I want, will survive. And all we are doing is creating the enabling environment. Scale-up becomes important. You have to demonstrate. Why is it important to demonstrate? You de-risk, you build confidence. But in this space, it's also about the interface with the consumer. So there's a whole lot of consumer testing that will go in. How are people interacting with this? And we're happy that we included as, as well the gender inten intentionality that Gates has actually asked us to bring in, which is important. I mean, to some extent, we didn't really think about that by design, but I think it was a valid sort of inclusion in that space. And so we started to say to our SMMEs and our tech developers, you need to start thinking about localization. You need to start thinking about industrialization. We will matchmake you. You need to start thinking about your value chain development. And then we had a whole range of other discussions with partners, investors, and various partners within the sector, bringing them all the time towards what we call the shared vision, the shared risk, the shared knowledge, and hopefully, in time, a shared impact. Finally, we do know that such a system will need a retraining of the workforce. So the idea is you will have to build in some sort of academy. It's not just simple knowledge dissemination. It's actually new practice that will come into being. So why did I put this up? This is an example of where you want to make a big shift in the system. It's not just about just seeking the one tech. It's about seeking a toolbox of tech and toolbox of commercial or business models that may be applicable in the system. And in the developing world, I do think we need more thinking around the different revenue models, the different delivery models, and the different institutional models that will actually enable it. Our CEO coined, so when we were looking at the vision, we, we actually plotted an industrial pathway, but our CEO coined the, the term that if we were going to realize this in the future, that actually you might have the first, as he put it, the Sanicon in the sanitation space, the first billion dollar company if, if we are able to, to, to get that technology up and running. So is that thinking around the framing of the transformative way in which we bring all partners together, in which we collaborate, in which we, we co-create, and in which we actually move the system forward? It is not unique. As you can see, guys that study this kind of thing, they were able to say, OK, you have a landscape, and you have a current regime. And actually, every now and then, you will have a small group of actors that have a common vision, that have a certain expectation of the way they want to see the world transforming. And that, that small group is the one that actually intervenes and shifts a system. And I think that's what that example shows you. But there are probably many other examples of how we could actually cluster uh, project, uh, projects in that space. But for a niche to develop, and I want to be very clear, you must be, it must be driven by key insights. You must understand what it is you're driving. It is not my pet project or anyone in the water sector. It is what is good for your community and your society, and are they willing to accept that this is a better way forward from where they have come? And I think that's the critical thing when you want to make a transformative sort of shift in the system. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to leave you with the following thoughts. There's a very nice ideation uh, methodology, Think Wrong, uh, by a US company. And they often say that sometimes in our technical space, we're very quick to say no but. You know, normally, you know, you don't, you don't have the technical acumen, and therefore you should not be designing for that system. But maybe every now and then, and if you're in the innovation space, you should be saying yes and. Why? Because your knowledge plus that innovator can actually create something quite significant. So stop saying no but. Let's start saying yes and. And then the possibilities are there in the innovation space. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie.
uh, that was wonderful. And uh, well, there's a lot there that I think we could continue to uh, listen to her about. But we're going to continue now with the panel and get some other perspectives on this. And I'd like to invite up to the stage now um, our panel members here. So we're going to start with uh, Nupur Bahadur. And why don't you start coming on up? She's a fellow and senior scientist in the Engineering, en Energy and Resources Institute in New Delhi. And she's also an honorary associate professor at uh, Deakin University in Australia. Uh, we would also like to invite up here Dr. Mohan, who is a senior professor of environmental and water resources engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And he is also um, uh, very well respected in the field, receiving many awards, including the very prestigious John Penny Cusick Eminent Engineer Award. So Dr. Mohan. I'd like to bring up to the stage Maria Lara Fernandez, who is the Deputy CEO of National Research and Innovation Agency in Uruguay. Pallavi Bishnoi, who is, she's a water expert for the World Bank 2030 Water Resources Group and the Norwegian Water Cluster uh, located in India. And she also acts as a technical core expert for the state of Uttar Pradesh government to support policy. So let's give all of our uh, panelists a hand, please. So we're going to build on the things that Valerie talked about. And I want to start off asking a question here for uh, Maria. And so Maria Fernandez, since you are with an organization and institute with the name Innovation is right in, in the title there, um, why don't you talk about a little bit your perspectives about how your institute and the work that you do, the work to, to actually the measures to drive innovation in the sector. Perfect. Uh, first of all, good morning for everyone and thank you very much for your invitation to take part of this panel. And thank you very much for your presentation. As you said, I am, I am from the National Research and Innovation Agency that's in Uruguay. As you know, Uruguay is a very small country in South America. And basically what we do is, ANI is a governmental institution that fosters and promotes research and innovation and the main mission is to apply the knowledge in the productive sector. That's basically the, the main point. And the approach is exactly that Valerie uh, explained to us before, combining all the, uh, all the, the key players. Right? And we have several tools, but basically answering your question, we have tools uh, directly oriented to the companies, to the productive sector, with innovation tools, a financing project, basically, uh, sharing with the companies the risk of innovating. And also we have uh, the national scholarship system uh, where, where we try to send students to study in Uruguay or abroad it's a graduate program for masters and PhD. And in connection with the water specifically, uh, we, we have a very important agreement with IHE in Delft to send a student to, to study masters and PhD there in sanitation field. Wonderful, thank you very much no, thank for you. that. Uh, Nupur. I'm going to ask you the next question, and uh, you work in India, and we're working towards the SDGs, and particularly SDG 6 with regard to the water challenges, and of course we have in, in your region a number of those challenges. So how do you see the role of technology and technological innovation in overcoming those, those challenges in developing nations like India? Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, IWA, for giving uh, me a chance to uh, be part of this uh, forum. And regarding the question, uh, so the role of technological innovation as we see in a developing country, as uh, um, um, Valerie has also well uh, maintained, that 
for a developing country, it has its own challenges, and particularly developing country like India having diverse, uh, so much diversity. And uh, earlier, like we had a uh, uh, different set of challenges, we were focusing mainly on the sanitation aspect and building the sewer networks and all. But uh, recently, with the uh, leadership and the focus on all aspects of SDG, and particularly SDG 6, so our focus is on covering all the aspects and particularly taking technology innovation, as you say. So we are working in the space of technology and as innovation. Innovation is just to think differently. So earlier we were thinking of centralized wastewater treatment systems. Now we have come up to decentralized systems. Uh, now then we were working on uh, the latest emphasis on smart cities. Uh, 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 redefining the toilets, then the sanitation needs, and if covering the different aspects, then the technology aspects, if you say we are more into looking at different aspects, let's say in water sector, so the leakage problems or identification or the monitoring system, so IoT has a good space in India now, so Indian government and also the corporate, so we now in India are focusing more on technology and innovation right into implementation in that space. So here the technology has a major role to play. Thank you. So I'm going to move to you, Dr. Mohan, and we've just heard from Nupur about the, the drive for the, the technology to drive innovation. And you are a, a person from the university with technical uh, background, and, and you drive technology. But is technological innovations enough? Is that sufficient for solving the water problems? Okay. Uh, good morning to all of you. So thanks to IWA. I strongly feel that technology innovation alone may not be sufficient for solving water problems. Especially I'm taking example from developing countries where we need a good partnership model. Otherwise, we start the kind of system but the operational and maintenance side, we are having a brake failure. And the second one, we need a good business model, which may be site-specific. It may not be possible for uh, one model which can be applicable globally everywhere. So we may have to come up with some kind of a business model. And third one is finance. So finance is very important, even though it's part of the business, but I think we have to put little more effort on this particular one. Why I am saying is we have been developing a lot of technology and we are still at the initial stage. We have not adopted the technological innovation in a full form. Uh, very much we are now starting only on the data collection on a real time. Maybe, you know, we may have to adapt very quickly on the cloud or maybe artificial intelligence or machine learning where we may have to implement all these technologies, then only then it will be possible to see the light of the day on the impact of the technological innovations. And uh, towards that, I would say that we should also make a lot of changes in the system. One is, uh, I strongly feel that the water requirement per capita per day, which is around 135 liters, which is really high especially for developing countries. And we create infrastructure to carry that much water from almost 120 kilometer from the source to the city. On the other hand, if I can, we know that it can be managed with less amount, 70 or 50 or 100 maximum. If I can do that, then I can reduce a lot of losses, reduce a lot of uh, infrastructure. That finance, I can use it for operation maintenance. So the main problem with the water infrastructure is we have less kind of a importance to operation and maintenance. So if we can dovetail this model, I think we can adapt to this technological innovation. Otherwise, innovation alone may not be able to sustain in the system for sustainable development. Okay, that's Th my Thank you. And, and that echoes very well what uh, Valerie had talked about, too, about the, uh, looking at those, those new models, the different approaches. 
Um, so building on that and what Valerie was talking about in her presentation, she spent a good amount of time talking about technologies that are in their infancy and many of them stall and that are not able to move on to the next level. So Pallavi, I'd like to talk to you and ask you to speak to this issue of, of how technologies can, can move into a place of scale up as is necessary uh, you know, in order to get them implemented. What are your perspectives on getting a new technology to scale? Um, first of all, brilliant presentation, Valerie, very insightful. Um, I, I love that curve, uh, the, the valley curve that you presented. I, I think um, it, it, it kind of uh, goes very well with what happens on the ground with uh, innovations. So, and like Professor Mohan said, it's not just about innovation, but also capacity building of the system to accept and adapt that innovation, the implementability implementation of, uh, of this innovation on the ground. Um, most of these innovations die out because the systems don't have that kind of capacity to adapt to it. And when it comes to scaling up, I honestly feel um, the government plays a, a big role in the water sector and uh, that's, that's something that has to be kept uh, in the loop uh, when, when we look at these innovations. Uh, by keeping the government at the bay, uh, I feel that that's, that's where we get blindsided. So in India right now, in my state, Uttar Pradesh, we're, we're running multi-stakeholder partnerships to address the key water management issues. And uh, we're bringing in the private sector, the uh, government, uh, the civil society, and the acad academia together to convene uh, and come up with solutions which are ground up and which require, uh, so when it comes to implementation, there's, there's lesser resistance uh, through, through the, uh, going through the system. And the policy making is easier because it's coming from the government itself, you know. The, this uh, question statement is coming from the government. And we have the innovators sitting on the other side of the table giving answers to those questions and the private sector to take it up uh, for, for scaling. So I feel that, that kind of models, uh, innovative models for partnerships um, re could really w work well when it comes to scaling up of these innovations. Thank you. Um, so Valerie, I'm going to bring you into the conversation here. Because you talked about, uh, as just as Pavlavi talked about ground up solutions, and you're talking about perspectives. You have an urban perspective versus a rural perspective, a developed world perspective versus developing nation perspective. Uh, so these perspectives all have values, but how do you then bring them together and integrate them? In particular, we also talk about top-down models versus bottom-up, and each one has their own value. So could you speak a little bit uh, from your perspective on the top-down versus bottom-up in terms of driving innovation? Thanks. Um, so I actually think in a developing world uh, perspective, because you're talking about water and sanitation, a pure bottom, bottom up uh, requires a little bit of a helping hand from a top down system. So you do require the signaling, the incentives to be in place. Uh, and it also requires the top, uh, the leadership to start thinking uh, around what would enable this environment to develop and grow. And so there they can do a lot of work, whether it's around policy or incentives or, or, or just bringing the right stakeholders to the table. Again, we all work in, in spaces where government departments have specific mandates, and sometimes they interpret those mandates in a certain way. We also have uh, government departments that have silos within their own organization. So there's a whole lot of what I call disruption, not only that the technology may bring to the water sector, but that implementing that technology would require disruption in the system itself to think differently and to come up with the kind of models and enabling environments for those things to happen. And again, because we are not, it's not universal, it's not one size that may fit all. It, it may be that the developing and developed uh, take different trajectories going forward. And, and, and maybe in the future, you know, this sort of scaled uh, on-site, non sewage sanitation might become the norm of the future. What if we are able to find a really sustainable thermal technology that you can fit into your house like, a, like an aircon, you know, and it's affordable. Mm -hmm. 
what if we are able to scale up at that level? Then you're talking something completely different than planning the next 100 megaliter per day or 400 megaliter per day sort of wastewater treatment plant. So the economics may shift completely, but you've got to allow the incubation space for innovators and creative thinkers to actually come to the fore. And I think for me, that's the biggest message. Think differently, understand that you're not just there about providing services and solutions, you're also about creating the enabling environment for innovations to take hold. Great, thank you. So let me build on that, because in order to have disruptions, we want to think differently, as you said. To think differently, and going back to your uh, slide, you said talk about think wrong. So that means asking these big questions, asking the question, why? Or why not? What if? So I'm going to open this up to the other four panelists here. What would be these big why questions that you would want to ask? What would you want to say that is going to change and disrupt the status quo so that we can have this transformational change that Valerie talked about? What would you say would be some of these big why, why not questions that you would like to ask? Who would like to start? Dupur? So you mean to say, like, why we have to ask? So. Uh, regarding the technology innovation, when uh, we talk about any, uh, so the requirement is, as very well said, the disruption in the thinking, first of all, at the first place. And when, as a technology developer, we move out, so we really need the support, the ecosystem. And the, we need, first, the end user for which we have developed the technology together with us, then as well said, top-down and bottom-up approach. So we need a regulatory system and an ecosystem to fund and upscale. So in India, particularly now, uh, we have come up with uh, such encouraging models. So uh, we have Startup India campaigns, Skill India. So with this, our government is encouraging us. So we have developed an innovation scale and regarding uh, so those questions which we as an innovator ask where, where to go, whom to approach, now they are being addressed. So hopefully um, innovation uh, space as it is growing, uh, we look forward to uh, implementation and development. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with the question because that, I think that that's the main point. I, I was thinking about that we are from different countries, and we are talking basically about the same topic, how to, to combine the different uh, actors from the society in order to, to increase the innovation, and through the innovation to go away with, with our countries. And, and, and why? Because in our experience, and we are full convinced of that, it's the only way to, to, to go away and to develop our reality and the, the main point is how to, to find the, the way to build the bridge between the knowledge and the public sector and the productive sector and how to, to combine all the, that's the, 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 the main issue, how to combine the actors that you were describing, the, the public sector, uh, of course the state, the public uh, resources, but also the the investors, the, all the stakeholders, no? And that's the way that we consider that we need to find. And the tools that we have in our agency are all of them in order to, to foster that, that, that process. Thank you. Mohan? Yes, please. Yeah. I just wanted to give an idea that uh, the wastewater, we always call as a wastewater, but it is not actually a wastewater. I think there should be a change in our mindset. This only used water. And normally it is having only 1% pollution. So if I can use this gray water, treat it with a simple treatment techniques, then I think we can solve the local problem as such. So in fact, now for the city, we are now implementing that gray water should be recycled in an apartment. So it cannot be sent out. So with a simple sand filter and pressure filter, and also the zero, it's like a zero liquid discharge, which will be really reducing the load on the wastewater treatment plant or used water treatment plant. In fact, we can recovery plant, it will be called as a reclamation plant or recovery plant. If our mindset changes, 
I think there will be a lot more that we can do a, a thing rather than sending the wastewater to again polluting the water bodies. So that's one. And the second one, I feel strongly still we have not considered water as an economic good. We always take it as a free commodity in many of the countries. So I think if we can attach the econo economy with that, I think there will be a lot more change that why not we do that? That's what. Great, great. So why not uh, treat the waste on site? And why are we calling it waste? Why can we not think about yeah. value? Pallavi, do you have uh, something on this? I think we're running out of time. Um, but I think my only why is going to be why is it taking so, so long for us? I mean, uh, we've, we've been meeting over, over the years and uh, discussing these, and we've known the solutions all along. So I, I just want to understand why is it taking so long for us to transform these systems? I mean, we, we make the systems, right? I want to uh, ask from Valerie, like, uh, how many years did it take for you to establish the sanity, like, all the aspects of it? So for that. So my colleague Jay over there is passionate about shit. And uh, he basically has been doing research probably for the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And out of that came the insight. And that's why we talk about sanity. Insanity is the play on the words. Because to some extent, it's insane. We're putting a whole lot of VIP toilets on the ground, and they fill up within two to three years because the design specs are all incorrect, etc. There's pollution happening on the ground. There's health and hygiene impacts. Uh, almond ova, for example, don't go anywhere. They, they basically just sit in the ground waiting to infect kids. And so you have to then say, well, is this the best we can offer? And once you start asking that question, then you start thinking a little bit differently about what could be out there that, that could actually fit for that sort of community and settlement type. And of course, then you can think bigger. You know, the cities of the future could be retrofitted with these systems if we develop it enough. You know, we've sent people to the moon. Surely we can develop toilets better. Well, um, with that, um, I think that I'm going to have, unfortunately have to bring this to an end, even though it was a very uh, enlightening discussion, and maybe leave the audience with thinking yourself about asking those big questions, asking those why questions that are going to dis disrupt things. Why do we have to do things this way? And then continue to probe into that. Uh, there was something that I learned from uh, a Japanese business culture about the five whys. You don't start, stop asking why once, but you dig down five times asking why to probe deeper and deeper to get to some changes and some disruption. So with that, I want to make a few announcements before we uh, completely conclude here. Immediately following this panel discussion, right outside there in the lobby in front of the IWA uh, pavilion, is going to be the uh, celebration for the World Water Loss Day. So today is World Water Loss, and it's our first celebration to uh, recognize the importance of uh, curbing the loss of water. So please join us uh, out there front for that celebration. For those of you who would are joining us for the gala this evening, and, and please do, Immediately following the closing session, out front of this hall, there will be buses to shuttle us to the gala. So just make sure when you're finished with the closing session, just move on out to the front, and there will be shuttle buses for you. And our next sessions will be starting at uh, 1030 AM this morning. Can we please have a big round of applause for all of our panelists? Thank you, and enjoy your conference. <laughs>